that he may lift you up in due time. Well, ever, uh, even the, the most cursory reading of these two verses makes it clear that Peter is addressing the issue of humility. And it is humility that will be our area of study this morning. At the time of Peter's writing these verses, pagan culture placed no value whatsoever in the idea or the notion of ethical humility. Rather, the cultural norm, the expectation, if you will, was consumed with self-aggrandizement, self-assertion, and self-fulfillment. If you think about it, it's really not much different than the situation we find ourselves in today. Just drive around in your car and you'll see bumper stickers that say things like, yes, it is all about me. Or, I'm humble and proud of it. A pastor friend of mine who will at this point remain nameless because he's not here, <laughs> once won the most humble award when he was in the seminary. But of course they took it away from him the next week when he, when he actually wore the pen that they gave him. <laughs> but it hits uh, much closer to home than that. When I told my, my good friend and business partner Ross that uh, this week's sermon was going to be on humility, he about doubled over in laughter. <laughs> he says, Oh man, you're in uncharted waters there, aren't you? <laughs> of course, this is from a man who once wrote a book entitled, No, I'm not conceited, but of course I have every reason to be. <laughs> but seriously, it is clear that the prevailing patterns of the society in which we live today are consumed with the idea that no one should have a poor view of themselves. And we ignore the biblical instruction that it is in humility that we gain a true and proper perspective of ourselves. But we also must recognize that we can't simply point a finger at society. Because when we point that finger, we find that there are three pointing right back at us. So if we really want to address the situation, what we have to do is we have to look in the mirror and address the person that's staring back at us. I've been painfully aware of, of all of this this week as I prepared for this sermon. And I think that as I've shared with you and many of you have shared with me, typically the, the sermons that I, or the message that I have to give, I have to give to myself first and foremost. Just like the one to which Peter spoke, we are living in a culture that is obsessed with self. Now we're going to deal with this subject somewhat topically this morning, yet without uh, ignoring Peter's instruction, I hope. There are five aspects of humility that I'd like to draw our attention to this morning, and I believe that they emerge from these two verses, and your careful reading of those verses will ascertain whether I'm accurate or not. The first point concerning humility is this. Humility will be revealed in our relationships. Now we've heard this before when we talked about the issue of leadership within the church. We discovered that what Peter was stressing was that eldership should be exercised in a spirit of submission to God and humility towards one another. Submission to God and humility to one another was to be the characteristic of leadership in our local church. So, he says in verse 5, in the same way, that is, in this same spirit of humility, in the same framework of submission, in the willingness to prefer others over ourselves, to make sure that the relationships between those who are young and the, those who are older is guided by humility as the supreme function. Now, it's obvious that there is to be submission to elders. So what Peter appears to be doing now is widening the range of the lens. And so now he's going to focus on those who were born later rather than earlier and says, young men who are particularly prone to an unhealthy uh, self-assertion, 
They should make sure that they display an attitude of humility to those who are older. It is, if you will, the same lesson that many of us learned when we were growing up. Uh, I know my parents uh, certainly uh, gave it to me, and that is respect your elders. Now, that may be somewhat of an archaic uh, uh, thought today, but when we were growing up, that's what we were taught. That there's a time to simply hold your tongue. You don't have to be a smarty pants all the time and think that you know what ev uh, everybody else doesn't know. So there is a time to hold your tongue and be quiet. There is a time to give deference to those who have lived a little longer. And by virtue of living longer and going through those experiences, they know a little bit more. That's what we needed to be told. And quite frankly, that's what this generation needs to be told as well. And then he widens it out even further. And he says, I want you to clothe yourself in humility towards each other. This is the seedbed or the soil in which the graces of Christ bloom, become radiant and attractive. In the midst of the family of God, in partnership with one another, in seeking to go forward together, if all of the graces uh, that God has given us are to be realized and brought to fruition, with, and given proper honor, then we need to accept those gifts with a humble heart. Not just from the younger to the older, but also towards one another, within that framework of our relationship. So the first thing, humility will be revealed in our relationships. That's the first thing. It's fairly straightforward. Humility is not something that you find in a vacuum. Humility is actually something that you find in action. Which brings us to our second point, which is this. Humility is primarily an attitude of mind. In verse 5, you'll see that the phrase, clothe yourself, and the first few words of verse 6, Peter makes it clear that humility is revealed in attitude and in action. It's not something that we're exhorted to feel. Peter doesn't say, I want you to feel humble. He doesn't say, I want you to pray about being humble. What's he say? I want you to be humble. 